Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. It's the 22nd of February. And don't look now, but we've got a march on Rome. In 1922, it was Mussolini's march on Rome. Today, it's the march on Rome of Beppe Grillo. And we'll tell you all about Beppe Grillo. He's likely to be the big international story, the big freak show coming out of the Italian elections, which are going to be held on Sunday and Monday. So the first time as tragedy, the second time as Grand Guignol, the second time as uh, the theater of cruelty and absurdity, which is Grillo. We will uh, expose him rather thoroughly. Uh and we're also going to have a re- we'll have some stuff on the uh, on the Vatican situation, and we will get a report I think from Reverend Pinckney about the uh, his actions on the NAACP, the situation in Michigan, and and what he's planning to do in the future. But let's look at it for a minute at the the doomsday machine which is about to strike. We are still living the consequences of the lunatic. Tea Party fanatics who swept into Congress in 2010 and in 2011, since they had to do something to justify their existence, they took the United States to the brink of bankruptcy. Naturally, Obama could have stopped them cold in their tracks at any time by simply pulling out the 14th Amendment and saying, sorry, boys, we're not going to go bankrupt. You can't do it. So why don't you be reasonable? And let's uh, let's negotiate. That's what a real president would have done. We don't have a real president, and that allowed these sociopaths to run wild. So the doomsday machine is the sequester, and it's a series of cuts. Uh, it's it's about a trillion dollars over a period of ten years, and that means it's a, a, a hundred billion in cuts every year. And uh, a lot of it comes out of defense. A lot of it comes out of the National Institutes for Health, Head Start, all sorts of other uh, programs. And this is the direct result of the Satan sandwich. This was the blackmail of the Tea Party lunatics, the complicity with that of uh, of this uh, shady character, Boehner, the orange man, and then uh, the need of Obama given his weakness, since he wouldn't play his strong card, to make a rotten compromise. And the rotten compromise was the Satan sandwich of August 2011. And remember, they set up the commission of the 12 tyrants. The 12 tyrants were supposed to come up with several trillion dollars worth of cuts, and they couldn't do it, despite the supposed inspiration of Simpson and Bowles, the two reactionaries, right? Simpson, who hates people, and Bowles, who loves money. He's an, uh, a, a veteran of uh, Morgan Stanley, as we know. These two characters should not be pontificating on television. They should be on their way to the Nuremberg Dock. That's where they belong. This is the Cat Food Commission. This is the Kill Granny Commission. But even with the propaganda hysteria and the elite unanimous, really almost unanimous support in the elite, for Simpson and Bowles. The 12 tyrants couldn't come up with anything, and that meant then that the the doomsday machine, the planned train wreck, goes into effect, and uh, that's what we're facing now. Well, what's the answer? The answer is roll it back. End it. Call it off. Cancel it. Forget about it. Just go home. We don't, not, doing nothing is far better than this kind of uh, of self destruction, right? It's like uh, you know having a hobby where you uh, you begin cutting off you know cutting off pieces of your own flesh, and of course what this shows is is the uh, the illustration of the thesis we've been talking about here for a long time. If you cut the federal budget in a depression, when you have the private sector depressed as a result of the Bush bubble and the crisis of the world derivatives market, which occurred in 2007-2008, the worldwide derivatives panic leading to a banking panic, or 
essentially meaning a banking panic. And then that, that comes down, and now you've got a depressed economy. Uh, if you start cutting the federal budget uh, at a time when government is still going, but the private sector has collapsed, if you add the cutting of government and the collapsing of government to the collapse of the private sector, which has already occurred, then you get the, the multiplier in reverse. In other words, for every job that is lost in government, you lose one or two or three jobs in the private sector, depending on what kind of government jobs you're cutting. And this time we're talking about shutting down assembly lines and production of the industrial military complex. But remember, the industrial military complex is the only industrial you've got left in many areas. So you don't want to simply throw that away. I'm not in favor of war production, but I am in favor of the careful reconversion and redirection of those uh, modern facilities, because they are the trump card that remains in the hands of the United States. To simply destroy them is national suicide, what the ultra-lefts uh, want to do. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, even Krugman, uh, Krugman, I don't think, understands this at all, that that, that is your modern uh, production sector. You better, you better take careful care of that and not simply dump it. Uh, so that's the problem with the ultra-lefts. But the, uh, the, the Republicans, of course, say, oh, well, we would like to, uh, to moderate the effects of the, of the sequester, the doomsday machine, the planned train wreck, but we demand genocidal cuts in entitlements. Well, you can't do that either, because that means you're cutting the maintenance of your labor force. If you want to have a labor force tomorrow, you've got to maintain it today. If they die off today, they won't be here tomorrow. So you've got to have a whole different approach. Instead of pushing for a low-wage economy with low energy and low capital intensity, the Republican plan, we've got to do uh, the opposite. And that means, uh, of course, uh, avoiding uh, this, um, th these cuts. So we, it's about a million jobs that will be lost uh, as a result of this. Right? Uh, I'm thinking with the old play by Sartre, the sequestered of Altona. <laughs> the sequestered ones. Uh, so this is now self-sequestration. After self-deportation with Romney, we've now got self-sequestration, right? Self-inflicted uh, wounds. The, uh, the, the, uh, the only way you can destroy the United States is to get the United States to destroy itself, thanks to the Tea Party and these, uh, and these Republican lunatics. So there it is. So uh, it's a very simple thing. Uh, Washington was gripped in 2010, 2011, into 2012 with austerity psychosis. Remember the infamous Abbauvan of uh, what uh, Ehrlichent uh, talked about in, uh, in the Weimar Republic. It's a collective psychosis of austerity, and it's somehow, I think, the idea for these Republicans that debt is equal to original sin or uh, debt is equal to... Uh, some uh, evil force in the universe, and it's, it's simply not true. And the, the kinds of ch childish nonsense that they talk about, um, for example, your children are going to have to pay the debt. The national debt is generally not paid, but it's maintained, and it can be cut down to size through economic growth, through inflation. The main force is that you, uh, you grow the rest of your economy. In other words, if you're... Uh, if your debt today is 50% uh, of your economy or 80% or whatever it is, then grow the economy and get it back down to 10 or 20%, and then it becomes uh, perfectly manageable. It actually becomes a tool of policy. But in the, in the original sin world of these lunatics, uh, that's not the case. So here we are headed for it, uh, and since we're the united front against austerity, we say no to the sequester. Roll it back, and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with all of this at Tarpley.net and Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed. And uh, Tarpley.net, you can find uh, well, the things I've written in the last four weeks. There's, uh, there's an essay on the wedge issue of gun control why this is an issue to stay away from on both sides. We've also got an essay on immigration. You want to make people feel welcome here 
and get them to be citizens because you need them. Without immigrants, the United States would be facing a demographic crisis. The population of Russia is declining. The population of Japan is declining. The population of large parts of Europe is declining. And the population here would be declining with disastrous effects, except that we have still the residual goodwill out in the world that people are willing to come to the United States and contribute to the U.S. economy. That is one of the other Trump cards that the United States still has. So you can't let your xenophobia, your hatred, your narrow-minded venom and prejudice, your bigotry turn against people. And Obama's plan is 13 years to become a citizen, eight years to get a green card, and then five years to become a citizen. 13 years. My God, uh, this is totally unacceptable. Think of the, the costs you're imposing. And these you're imposing costs on the whole U.S. economy. It's 20 million people, almost. Uh, and you're going you're gonna to make them go through all of this stuff. This is ridiculous. You want to wrap this up, for the most part, within one year. One year. Call it an amnesty. Call whatever you want. Regularization, normalization, naturalization, assimilation. You want people in the labor force. You want them to get a driver's license so they know they want them to pass the written test and the driving test. You want them to be in the health system so they don't become the vectors of, uh, of epidemics, right? You've got to have herd immunity, and that means everybody. So if you're here, you've got to be uh, eligible for the care and so forth. Common sense, self-defense, and you want, like the city of Baltimore, some other places, they make it clear they want people to come. Yes, indeed, we want people to come. Uh, it is one of the trump cards that the United States still has. And these hate-filled bigots would like to throw it away. So we've got one on the gun control issue. We've got one on immigration reform. We've got uh, one on the uh, c crisis in the papacy, that the, the vicar of Christ can hardly resign. This really doesn't, doesn't work. The two previous examples, of course, Gregory the Twelfth would be a positive example, but unfortunately, the, what we're dealing with today is more like Celestine the Fifth, the beginning of a crisis. In the case of Celestine the Fifth, it was 150 years of crisis until it was actually ended by Gregory the Twelfth. But this is going to be more like the beginning of a crisis. And now we've got one about the Italian elections and what is likely to happen. And above all, a warning against Grillo, cave grillum, as we would say, beware of Grillo. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's all at tarpley.net, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, the um, updates are on Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed. As, for example, today, when Grillo has his march on Rome, oh my God. Um, so um, what else can we say? Uh, the uh, otherwise the situation uh, Obama the, one of the positive things one of the few positive things Obama had in his State of the Union is that the minimum wage should go to seventy percent sorry to nine dollars and uh, it looks like that has support of, of between two thirds and three quarters of the American people it's about seventy percent want the minimum wage go to nine to go to nine dollars and the reactionary Republicans trot out their tired discredited monetarist tax, a reminder that economics is the most corrupt discipline because it bears immediately on money, and therefore it is a tissue of mystifications and excuses. Uh, economists long believed that nobody was unemployed except because they wanted to be. It was simply impossible that anybody could be out of work because they couldn't find a job. That was the view of the economists. And of course, that if you raise the minimum wage, this diminishes uh, jobs. Well, no, the, the studies are all in. The studies all say no. They've all been collated into a meta study, a, a cum cumulative study. No, raising the minimum wage does not diminish uh, employment. Um, now, if we just look for a minute at foreign, foreign affairs, Kerry. Uh, we'll talk about Kerry in a minute in relation to Italy, but we now have 
Skull and Bones at the State Department. A Yale face man from Skull and Bones. Uh, hollow, to be sure. Uh, John Forbes Kerry, a Boston Brahmin from Skull and Bones. And uh, how is he going to start off his tenure at Foggy Bottom? Well, today in the Washington Post, we have one of the aides of Senator Lieberman, who says the best way to do it would be to bomb Syria. You've got to have plan A, and then you've got to have plan B. And plan A was to lean on Russia. It's not working. Uh, and, of course, it, it, this article actually recognizes that Russia rightly, I would say, rightly feels that you can't allow the United States to conduct yet another regime change using either overt or covert military means. In this case, it's covert. Uh, so therefore, you've got to get ready to bomb. Limited bombing, of course, outside of the United Nations. Um, now, the, there is a growing awareness that the, the nerve and fist of the Syrian rebellion are terrorists. Al-Qaeda killers, death squads. A couple of examples. Today on National Public Radio, David Ignatius, the foreign affairs man uh, from the intelligence community who writes in the Washington Post, he says, we have to recognize that the main forces of the Syrian rebellion are terrorists. They're terrorists. And instead of at that point saying, well, we better back off and make sure they don't get any stronger... He says, oh, no, the United, Nations, the United States has got to go in there and, uh, and, and counterbalance them by making the other groups uh, stronger. Well, no. <laughs> if they're terrorists, why, why do you want to let the terrorists take over the country? After all of those people who got killed in Iraq, remember, we'll never allow al-Qaeda to get another sanctuary. Well, they've got one in Libya, and now it's time to give them another one in Syria, according to Ignatius and company. Also... Terry Moran of ABC News earlier this week was in Syria. Now, he was invited by the government. And uh, the first evening of his uh, interviews, he did some interviews with Syrian Christians who had been kicked out of their villages. They fled, fearing for their lives because lunatic fundamentalists were coming in. Jihadis, terrorists, Al-Qaeda... So that is now growing, and we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Here in Washington, D.C., it is the 22nd of February, and uh, let's look for a a minute at the the Vatican. Um, One of the considerations that guides us in looking at this is the the maxim or the the doctrine uh, put up by Dante, in the uh, in the Divine Comedy, uh, thirteen, fifteen, thirteen, twenty, thereabouts, that uh, the Empire and the Papacy should be kept separate. That uh, the the system that that the Dante is aware of is a system that has two sons. We're, I'm citing in particular the famous Marco Lombardo canto of the middle. Purgatory, and it's actually the architectonically the center canto of the entire work. In other words, it's the whole thing is a hundred canti, and this is uh, forty-nine to fifty. So it's the centerpiece. It is that the empire and the papacy should be separate. That the king of France is one person, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire is one person, but that the papacy is distinct. It's a different operation. It is not like the Byzantine patriarch is simply the appointee, the right-hand man of the empire. No, this in the West, it's different. So he says the, the old system was Rome used to have two sons. One son showed you the right way to proceed on earth, and the other one showed you the way to heaven. But now, when the sword of the empire is joined with the crook, right, the staff of the bishop, this is bad, leads to bad consequences uh take a look at that um that's one of his uh, one of his principal uh points of view and i think it's right because from this you have to remember the whole notion of separation of powers checks and balances would be unthinkable without this because this was in western civilization the main manifestation of a key separation of power church is one thing 
government is another, and they fight. They often fight. Uh, in particular, you know, in the in the uh, before eleven hundred, the investiture controversy, where you have uh, Pope uh, Gregory Hildebrand, and uh, on the one hand, and the em- Emperor Henry of the Holy Roman Empire, and they fight. And and actually, in this case, the the fight is that the Pope can assert the the independence. Some say the superiority of the papers. It's I think independence is fair enough from the empire. So this leads us to the main conclusion. The next pope should not, repeat, not be American. This is a disaster. We don't need it. Uh, suppose, <laughs> one poss- we'll get to this in a minute, but you could have, you could have popes, popes with the same name if they both come from, from the United States. This would be bad for the world. I would take it even further. No Anglophone should be pope. Nobody whose native language is English should be considered for the papacy. It's too dangerous. It's culturally too much power in the same hands. This would lead us back towards totalitarianism on a world scale. Obviously, the power of the papacy in the church is not expressed. It's not what it used to be, you might say, or it's not expressed in the same way that it was, but it's still considerable. Uh, It's 1.2 billion people. It's the biggest single uh, religious uh, administration, certainly, in the world. We don't need that matched up with the uh, with the U.S. government and the and the British and and the rest of the echelon uh, powers. So nobody from Africa who's an Anglophone should be considered. I'm sorry, from Ghana, no. From Nigeria, no, no, no. Somebody whose native language is not English. I mean, maybe the, the guy from the Philippines, if that's his native language, that's somewhat different. Um, but somebody. Who's a uh, you know a, a purebred Anglophone? No, no, because it puts too much power in one place. Now, the I say this because the Washington Post last Sunday had a very sinister article about how the world needs an American Pope. That the American system of pragmatism and getting things done and optimism is exactly what is needed. No, no, some of those are good values, but not. The price in this case is much too great. And uh, it focuses on Cardinal Dolan of New York. Cardinal Dolan uh, supposedly leading a group of um, about 10 U.S. cardinals who are uh, considering voting as a block. Um, The situation seems to be this. The Italian cardinals are tired of foreign popes, right? After 25 years of Wojtyla and uh, and eight years of Ratzinger, Poland and Germany have had their say. They want that to go back to Italy. That might not be the worst idea. That might be that might be a fine idea. Um, what's been missing in these last two papacies is the sense of intrigue, frankly, of strategy, of uh, planning. Of, uh, of of a, a, a political touch, that that is what is is missing. Uh, although Wojtyla certainly did better than Ratzinger. You read that article that I mentioned before. You'll see that that Wojtyla at least he showed the flag of the papacy in in fighting against Bush on the uh, on the Iraq War. Ratzinger didn't even go through the motion. Put it that way. So. The Italian cardinals seem to want Cardinal Scola, S-C-O-L-A, of Milan. And again, that sounds plausible to me. If it's not Scola, it could be someone I like probably less, Ravazzi, R-A-V-A-S-I, the cultural minister, so to speak, the guy who's got the great cultural synthesis, uh, not, maybe not enough experience running an archdiocese and things like this, um, Ravazzi has uh, an advantage in that he is giving the Lenten uh, preaching right during Lent now. In other words, uh, the special sermons that are given, that's Ravazzi. Scola's advantage is that he seems to be the one groomed by Ratzinger and, and get, getting the support of the Italian group of, uh, of cardinals. Who else do we have mentioned? Cardinal Scherer of Brazil. This might be feasible. Uh, again, I would prefer the, uh, I think it's uh, Sandri of Argentina, but 
maybe sharer of Brazil is also a possibility. And there's a lot of guesswork in this stuff. Remember, Cardinal Schoenborn of, B- of Vienna, no. That is, unfortunately, a, uh, uh, somebody who's much too close to the, to the British and, for that matter, to the Israelis. This is not a good, uh, a good uh, bet. Uh, and the German-speaking area has now been taken care of, so let's, let's uh, keep the rotation going. The, uh, what we hear from the Italian press is that Dolan is not so much pushing himself for Pope, but he is trying to organize for Sean O'Malley, Cardinal of Boston. So Dolan of New York is trying to be the election manager, the kingmaker, Pope maker for Sean O'Malley of Boston. Now imagine this situation. Suppose you have Pope O'Malley in Rome, and then we have Governor O'Malley of Maryland here, who might conceivably uh, become the Democratic presidential <laughs> candidate, might become president. Uh, it's, it, it's not maybe the most likely hypothesis, but it's possible. O'Malley, Governor, Governor O'Malley of Maryland is running for president, no doubt about it. He's out there traveling. So then we'd have Pope O'Malley and President O'Malley. This violates, clearly enough, Dante's principle in the Marco Lombardo canto that you should not have the Pope and the Emperor so close. Uh, In other words, it's mainly that the Empire is going to take over the papacy. That was... uh, that was one, the danger, right? It turned out that the, the danger was that the King of France, in his day, took over the papacy, right? King Philip the Fair of France essentially kidnapped the whole papacy. Uh, Pope O'Malley and President O'Malley, that's too much for the world. That's one O'Malley too many. Uh, and we don't want that, and we don't want that to happen. So, there will be the Vatty Leak report by Cardinals Heron, Tomko, and De Giorgi. And the Italian press is full of gossip about what will that Batty Leaks report actually say. We'll try to find out, and we'll be back in the next segment. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarp here in Washington, D.C. It's February 22nd. Now, Sunday and Monday, Sunday all day and Monday from uh, whoa, 9 to 3 or so local time, you have the Italian uh, elections. Now, this I think this is a... Uh, an important uh, election, much more so than the, than the recent ones. So I've written about this, and I'd like to give you a summary. And, of course, we want to warn people, above all, against the media hype, which will be coming for the scurrilous Beppe Grillo, the right-wing demagogue with left cover, certainly, but uh, right-wing demagogue nevertheless. Let's look at the whole thing. The um, Italian politics is fragmented. It's Weimarized to a fairly well. There are just dozens and dozens of parties. I estimated 25, but it's actually more. It depends on what you want to count uh, as a party. It's scores of parties, right? They might easily get up to 40 or, or, or so. But uh, in order to get into the parliament, you've got to have 4% if you're a party or 10% if you're a an alliance of parties, a coalition. So... Essentially, there are four big ones and a couple of smaller ones. The largest one is what's left over of the Italian Communist Party, the old PCI. This is now called the Democratic Party, bland enough. The Democratic Party, it's a social democratic uh, party, and it's led by Bersani. Bersani is the guy with dark hair but bald. And Bersani is a colorless bureaucrat. Bersani, he's going to get the most votes, as far as we can tell, although there's a chance he might fall below Berlusconi, but certainly uh, Bersani uh, looks like he's going to get the most votes. This guy is so colorless, let me put it this way. Hollande is colorless, and Bersani is an attempted imitation of Hollande. He's trying to imitate Hollande in every way, because of course Hollande won, and that's what Bersani wants to do. And uh, Bersani's project is that he is Monty Light. He's the current IMF, European Central Bank, Goldman Sachs, trilateral Bilderberg, Monty, except with uh, some um, window dressing, you know, a little bit less severe here and there, a few more jobs, a little bit more 
uh, equality of distribution and so forth. Uh, but that's that's Bersani. Bersani's position in life is to beg the bankers to let him take over the government, and if they will, he will break the union movement, break strikes, and impose austerity through the government. So wage austerity and fiscal austerity on the government side. But with that, he's going to get uh, the majority, because most people don't understand this. This is somebody, if you think of the, uh, the social democracy in Germany in the 20s, this is Friedrich Ebert. This is Otto Wells, and I hope not all of that comes true. But he's, he's Monty Light. You've got a guy in there called Vendola. Vendola would be the ultra-left. That's called left ecology freedom. And Vendola is also uh, offering himself as a way for Monty to maintain his austerity program. Okay, that's number one. Second comes Berlusconi. Berlusconi, by now we know, right? He's a satyr, right? He's a genial satyr. He's got this personal life going on. But at the same time, he is the main enemy of the CIA, the main enemy of the, uh, of the State Department. Schäuble, the finance minister of Germany, who has now be- degenerated to a complete austerity ghoul, Schäuble actually said Italians should not vote for Berlusconi. Well, if Schäuble says no, then this is worth uh, a, a second uh, look. Uh, so this is the uh, the Berlusconi party and, and a bunch of others. Some of them split off from Berlusconi. This is the only candidate with any positive features. I'm sorry. He's got this, you know, circus going on at his Arcore uh, estate, but it's the only one with positive features. Close friend of Putin, North Stream Pipeline, South Stream Pipeline, just his last interview, he says, they ask him, what did you do when you were governor, you know, when you were the prime minister? And he said, I built the fast rail. I came from Milan to Rome in two hours and 30 minutes because of a fast rail that I built, and I had to fight off the greenies, and I had to fight off the magistrates to build it. And then he says, I'm for freezing all foreclosures, says Berlusconi. No foreclosures on homes, on your primary residence, and no foreclosures on factories and machine tools. No foreclosures. Now, there, there's a concrete thing. That's the most concrete thing that I've heard in the entire campaign. Now, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I must say, Italians generally have a um, much, uh, I think, healthier attitude, strategic voting. The American thinks that a vote is the expression of your deepest value system. The Italian thinks, well, it's just, you know, it's just tactics, right? It's just, uh, you know, to get a result. That's much healthier. So if you're a strategic voter, you, you can, you'll understand pretty much what I'm, what I'm telling you. Bersani will continue Monti. Berlusconi is the only one with positive features. And then we have Grillo. Now, I want to talk to you a lot about Grillo, but Grillo is essentially a demagogue. He's a colorful and talented demagogue. He's a former television comedian. He then became an uh, internet blogger during the Audis, and he flirted with 9-11 truth and all kinds of uh, radical things. Um, this is the expression of the breakup uh, of the entire system, and I want to uh, talk to you about this at some length. Uh, Grillo is going to come in third, so we got Bersani with about thirty-three percent, Berlusconi with just under thirty, unless. Although I must say, Berlusconi was closing fast on Bersani. The last poll was February eighth. The last poll that can be legally published was held on February eighth. Uh, Grillo is thought to be approaching 20%. He does get huge crowds, right? Tens of thousands of people, Turin, Milan, Rome today. But, you know, it's like the Orange Revolution in Kiev. You can get a huge crowd in the piazza, but that doesn't mean you have the millions and millions of voters who can't and won't come to such uh, demonstrations, right? It's, you know, housewives and old people can't do that. Workers can't do it. And then we have Monti. Monti, of course, has been in power since uh, November of 2011. Unemployment has gone from 8% plus to 11% plus. It's going to go to 12%. Youth employment, uh, unemployment is 37%. Industrial production is down at least 7%. 
and orders have collapsed 15% uh, in December and January. So Monty is ballooning. This is killer, deadly, brutal austerity. Read, you can read about uh, the things in, in, in my article. He's got uh, increases in the age of pensions. He's got uh, increases in taxes, in particular the property tax was raised by 30% and extended to a lot of people who, who didn't have it. He's a complete failure, but Monty is the agent of the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, Goldman Sachs. He is, of course, personally from the Trilateral Commission, from Bilderberg. He was the head of the Bocconi University. We'll talk about him a little bit more, too. Then we have a couple of other smaller lists. There's the Civic Revolution of Ingroia, which pretends to be to the left of Bersani, although they're also... Uh, impotent, and then there's there's a funny list called the the um, stop the decline with Janino, and this is a clique of neoliberal sort of Chicago boys uh, economists. Um, not good, and it was just found that Janino claimed to have a master's degree from Booth University in Chicago, I think it is, which he never he never had. Now, what government is likely to emerge? The government that the bankers want, Medio Banca and uh, Credit Agricole and Monti de Paschi, they want Bersani and Monti. That is the most likely one. The problem with that is that if Bersani gets most, if he gets the most votes of any party, he gets a bonus. He goes up to 54% of the Chamber of Deputies. In the Senate, it's harder because you don't get that bonus. But uh, Bersani, Monti, the, the problem is that Monti may get less than 10%, so his coalition won't go through and maybe none of his parties get 4%, and then he gets absolutely nothing. So that is the one that the bankers want, but it's, it's not guaranteed. Bersani Berlusconi would be an institutional alliance, sort of a grand coalition. It's possible. Uh, Bersani Grillo, not very likely. And then there's the Governissimo of Bersani Berlusconi Monti, everybody but Grillo. Uh, that would give Grillo the chance to grow. Anyway, those are the possibilities. Back in a minute with more. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. It's the 22nd of uh, February, and uh, Grillo is marching on Rome. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to cover his event because he's speaking at 9 o'clock Rome time. So that'll be... Three o'clock here, and uh, we've already finished recording the program, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, but we want to talk about it. We can tell you pretty much what he's going to say. Uh, but let's let's look at the, how did we get to the situation? Right? Somebody, I, my summary would be, you have a genocidal professor, that's Monty. You have a genial satyr with, with these qualities that I say. That's Berlusconi, a big, uh, you know, multi-billionaire, six billion dollar fortune, and then you've got a colorless bureaucrat. That's Bersani, and then you have a scurrilous clown, foul mouth, and uh, he looks like a derelict. Right? He, certainly, uh, Italy has a uh, reputation for elegance, beauty, right? Elegance of fashion and design, cars food, Renaissance paintings, uh, aesthetics, <laughs> but not, not Grillo. He looks like the fabulous furry freak brothers have come back. And indeed, I think this is, this is what he may come from. At least culturally, he reminds me of a group that was active in Genoa, where he comes from. The Lud, the Ludites, remember the, the machine destroyers? The Grupo Lud, L-U-D-D, the Luddites of Genoa between 1969 and 1975. Anybody listening in who knows anything about this, if you know Il Grupo Lud of Genoa, 69 to 75, was Grillo a member? Let me know. Anyway, here's how we got here. Through a series of coups, let's start with Napolitano, the president of the Italian Republic. Usually a figurehead, but not anymore. And having powers that were always considerable during a government crisis, right? Because would, who would get the government and form the government and so forth. Napolitano comes from the old right-wing faction of the Italian Communist Party, the Amendola faction. In those days, Giorgio Amendola was known as Fat Giorgio, 
and Napolitano Giorgio was known as Skinny Giorgio. Again, these are people like Noska, Ebert, Scheidemann, these, the Otto Wells in particular. We now know, thanks to the fact that U.S. Ambassador Richard Gardner published his memoirs in 2005, we know that during the period uh, 1977 to uh, you know, 1981 or so, Carter years, Gardner, the U.S. ambassador, was meeting secretly with Napolitano, at that time probably the most right-wing leader of the Italian Communist Party, the PCI. So this also means that during the Moro kidnapping, and this is where it gets ugly, during the Moro kidnapping, Gardner was meeting with Napolitano. Now, the U.S. is, of course, imp- implicated uh, up to the uh, the hairline in the uh, Moro assassination. So what, what is the role there? What did Napolitano know, and when did he know it? Interesting thing to look at. Um, Berlusconi came back into power in 2008. Immediately, the U.S. became alarmed because of the friendship between Berlusconi and Putin. This is political, it's economic, it's personal, it's all kinds of things. It's uh, panache, right? It's some people who are out of the ordinary. So the U.S. attempt to overthrow Berlusconi began almost immediately. Take a look at this article. You can see evidence of this from the press. Uh, In uh, 2009 arrives the the new U.S. ambassador, David Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E, David Thorne is from Skull and Bones. He's from Skull and Bones, and he's the roommate of John Forbes Kerry, the current Secretary of State. Isn't that interesting? David Thorne, and he's still there, I believe, the roommate of John Forbes Kerry at Yale, member of Skull and Bones, and Thorne's sister, twin sister, was Kerry's first wife. So David Thorne is the former brother-in-law of Kerry, in addition to being his roommate from college. I'm afraid Italy is going to take a beating because of the obvious interest that that Kerry will have to focus. Kerry wants to begin his tenure, maybe not just with an attack on Syria, but with the overthrow, the smashing up of Italy, uh, the elimination of, of, of basically a central government in the country. Now, the first attempt to overthrow Berlusconi was done with uh, Thorne, calling in the neo-fascist Feeney. Feeney had been the uh, youth leader of the uh, MSI, the fascist party. He was the Dauphin of Almirante, the fascist leader. So uh, he, at, by this point, he was the, the uh, Berlusconi had made him great. Berlusconi had made him the president of the Chamber of Deputies, so the Speaker of the House, you might say. Uh, and Thorne was, uh, conv- he worked with uh, Feeney, and Feeney had simply defected from Berlusconi's party. He took about 35 members of the uh, Chamber of Deputies and 10 or 15 senators. And the hope was that that would bring down Berlusconi. This was a coup d'etat that was planned. Didn't work, because Feeney did not get enough people to come with him. There's also a role here for Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi, Speaker of the House for quite a while there. Uh, Her colleague, right? her similar, her homologue, was Feeney. So she also got in on this uh, coup d'etat. So Kerry and Pelosi and Thorne convinced Feeney to try to bring down Berlusconi, but it fails. Now, the second coup revolves around Draghi, and this is the one that works. This is done not with the uh, parliament, but with the spreads. When Mario Draghi became the head of the European Central Bank, and that's Halloween 2011, October 31st to November 1st, 2011, at this point... Uh, Napolitano goes into action with the help of Draghi, and they have an attack on Italian bonds. The interest rate on the bonds goes up to 7%, and above all, the spread goes up to 5.75%. In other words, Italy has to pay 5.75%, 575 basis points, more than Germany, to borrow. And this creates a huge crisis, right, because this means you're on your way to becoming Greece and Portugal and Spain, and so forth. And that panics the parliament, and that finally brings down uh, Berlusconi. Now, for months, Napolitano had been scheming, and he wanted to bring in Mario Monti, the head of the Bocconi Business University, Economics University. Monti, of course, Eurogarch, Eurocrat, 
member of the European Commission, member of the Barroso Commission, other commissions, Bilderberg, Trilateral, Goldman Sachs. That's Monty. It's amazing. Um, he has no public office, never ran for office. Napolitano makes him senator for life. And within a couple of days, he makes him prime minister. Uh, no election. Berlusconi said, let's have an election. Di Pietro, the old, uh, older anti-corruption uh, activist, says, let's have an election. No, says Napolitano. We don't want an election. The needs of democracy have to yield to the needs of the markets. Well, that's exactly what should never, never happen. Now you see why Napolitano is known as Henry Kissinger's favorite co- communist. Business Week called Napolitano the point man for the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in Italy. I call him the new von Hindenburg, because what Hindenburg did in uh, March of 1930, when the SPD government of Miller fell over unemployment insurance and the pressure to cut it, they brought in Brüning, and he couldn't get a majority. He couldn't get a parliamentary majority. He was, in a sense, the, the first presidential government. So Hindenburg declared a state of emergency and used the emergency powers to keep Brüning and then von Papen and von Schleicher and finally Hitler in power between 1930 and 1933. So Napolitano is more or less on the same track. No elections and bringing in a government of technocrats all faceless, people nobody had ever heard of. The labor minister was the one who got the most publicity because when she brought out the anti-pension reforms, she cried. She cried. So that's where Monkey comes from. He's been in power now for 15 months. His austerity is brutal, but it hasn't worked. It's a failure. So now we have an election in the midst of this. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's the 22nd of February in Grillo. The populist Qualunquista demagogue is marching on Rome, even as we record uh, the program. Now let's look at, uh, at Grillo. This is right-wing cultural populism demagogy. Uh, it targets individual politicians. It targets political parties. It, ta- it targets banks much less, although it mentions them. It does not deal with policies. It says these people are bad, these people are corrupt, get rid of them, we have a war with them, and so forth. But it doesn't have policies, and above all, it has really no program. It has a laundry list which has come from the, from the base, and from the individual dupes of this process. But it's not really a, a policy, and there is no coherent policy. Now, Grillo, as I say, uh, starts off in Genoa back at least in the days when there was the Luddite Renaissance and all kinds of other crazy stuff in uh, Genoa. He then became a comedian on Italian television at the end of the 70s. By the Audis, he had this blog, and we'll get into how he could have this blog, because this is a committee behind him. He's a synthetic candidate in that sense. And uh, he uh, built himself up with, with referenda, which is his answer to everything. Everything gets a referendum. You don't have representative government. You have constant referenda, referendums. And one of the ones, it's actually a good cause, right? He says no to the privatization of water. Fine. That's you shouldn't have it. But then he goes at the same time, no to nuclear energy. Well, that's just suicide. That's the end of your country, if that's uh, what you're going to have. Uh, the other thing about him, he's a petty dictator inside his party. He's an autocrat. Uh, he expels people left and right. He says to them, you can't go on television and be interviewed. Obviously, he wants the attention for himself. And he says he doesn't want to go on television, at least not Italian television, only foreign. And among the foreign, he likes Rupert Murdoch, uh, Anglophile. He, he likes the, the British reform of the banks. He likes the BBC. He likes Sky Television of Murdoch. He's an Anglophile. And uh, from Mazzini on down, Anglophile in Italy, not a good, not a good bet. Now, where does this come from? There's something called the Womo Qualunque, Womo Qualunque of 1944. 
This is a petty bourgeois phenomenon, just like like uh, like Grillo. This was a, co- a comedian even then, 1944. The comedian Janini starts with this uh, anti-government, anti-politician, anti-tax, but pro-free market, pro-deregulation, liberal, paleoliberal, neoliberal economics. Uh, that's qualunquismo. Qualunquismo is the Italian word for cynical uh, right-wing populism, and the idea is this is reactionary, and it is. Uh, another example, Pujadisme, Pujad. Pujad in France was the movement of shopkeepers, right? Similar stuff. Petty bourgeois base, anti-government, anti-politician, leave me alone, get off my back, let the private sector work, and of course, the Tea Party. What are we talking about? This is, uh, the Tea Party has certain ugly features that are specific to the U.S., uh, Grillo has certain equally ugly, um, and certainly ug- ugly features that are specific to his cultural situation. But he's not an individual. Behind Grillo and making his internet uh, success possible, we have this shadowy Casaleggio Associates. Casaleggio Associates. Now, John Roberto Casaleggio is the uh, most visible part of this. He has co-authored a book with Grillo. The book is called We Are at War. We are at war? How are we at war? We're at war with the political parties. We're at war with the political parties. Now here, parenthetically, this is where you get Grillo and LaRouche united in the struggle, because, you know, you look at LaRouche in the last couple of months, he's saying, it's time to end all political parties, down with political parties. Well, what can we conclude can it be that in the U.S. intelligence community, there's a desire to smash up political parties as a step towards the smashing up of the nation state, of the modern state? Remember, in the United States, you could not have secessionism until you had no national party left. It was when the Democratic Party in 1860-61 split into two parts, and the Whig Party was gone, and the Republican Party was not in the South. That's when you had secessionism, so the, you get the idea. Without national political parties, you can have uh, much more easily the destruction of the modern state. So this is a big theme for uh, Grillo. Um, Casaleggio had worked for Olivetti. Olivetti uh, it was, a, it was like IBM, except that it had this technocratic, utopian view of uh, information science. Um, this company has been almost completely destroyed, by the way, by uh, De Benedetti, the Soros of Italy. So at Casaleggio Associates, Casaleggio does what? Uh, political consulting. He does internet marketing, internet in general. You get the idea. Uh, Casaleggio Associates, the other leading light there, and this is interesting, is Enrico Sassoon. Sassoon is the head of the American Chamber of Commerce in Italy. So he represents all the U.S. corporations in Italy, or at least he's a head of one of their committees. He's a leading light of the American Chamber of Commerce in Italy. That's Enrico Sassoon, and he's on the board of the Italian branch of the Aspen Institute. Other members of the board are largely drawn from the Bilderberg Group. He's also the head of the Italian uh, version, the Italian edition of the Harvard Business Review. So, Harvard, American Corporations, Aspen Institute, Bilderberg, that's the dominant person up until he just quit, uh, of Casaleggio Associates. So that's what's behind uh, Grillo. Who writes his blog? Some people say Casaleggio. Who writes his speeches? Who writes his Twitter? And uh, who who is the enforcer? Who kicks people out of these par- uh, the party? I think we've had a bunch of people purged. Look at the article. You get at least the general idea. And these are people, they're members of the provincial council of uh, the regional council of Emilia Romagna or the Bologna city council or the Ferrara city council or places like this. They just get fired by Casaleggio, by... by uh, by Grillo. Now, the big idea here is decrescita, decrescita, meaning 
atrophy. <laughs> In other words, growth is one thing. What's the opposite of growth? Well, it's atrophy. So his, his slogan is atrophy. And this comes from another crackpot, quack, charlatan theoretician, Palante, the so-called economist Palante, who is based on a French original. We'll talk about this in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, the 22nd of February. Uh, when Mussolini organized his march on Rome in 1922, he, he didn't want to stay there because he was afraid he might get shot or jailed or something. So he, he waited near the Swiss border, and he sent instead his triumviri, committee of three, to run the march on Rome. De Bono, De Vecchi, and Balbo. Uh, now presumably, uh, Grillo will be there for his own march on Rome, but maybe he has triumviri also. His triumviri might be Casaleggio, Sassoon, and Palante, the, uh, the economist of atrophy, of growth in reverse. Um, Grillo likes to make fun of people's names. Right? He calls Monti Rigor Montes, and that, that is funny, but uh, in this case, it might be Palante Paloso, his, uh, his economist, right? The boring uh, Palante, and um, this uh, doesn't, doesn't, look, uh, doesn't look very good. Now, uh, let's just look at what this turns out to be in policies. As I say, the economics are, this is a step beyond zero growth. This is negative growth, and this is negative growth and degrowth, right? Growth in reverse. Atrophy, economic atrophy as a positive goal. And it comes from this palante, but with inputs also from Amory Lovins and Lester Brown. It's actually funny. This is not so far from Holdren, right? Holdren... Uh, the the science advisor for Obama, if you can believe that, right? A totally uh, useless uh, figure. But now let's let's look at the uh, the policies. Uh, how is this uh, atrophy economics of atrophy uh, expressed? First of all, there's no demand to roll back austerity. There's no demand that says hire the people, rehire the people uh, that that were laid off and roll back the wage cuts and restore the pensions and all this. Compare Grillo to Syriza. Compare Grillo to Alexis Tsipras of Syriza, right? Tsipras coming forward with organization, leadership, program, strategy, um, trying to seize power, right, with all the ups and downs that that means. You look at Grillo, it's the opposite. He says, I'm not a leader. Uh, of course, he's a dictator, um, he won't go on television. He's got all these fetishes and so forth. Um, but the main thing is he's not, he doesn't have any anti-austerity demands. He has no demands that would uh, immediately help the average working family of, of the ones that, it, that he can even hope to get. Uh, whereas with Syriza, it was, it was all that. So there's no anti, there really is no anti-austerity. You can say that after 15 months of Monty's IMF austerity, along comes Grillo with the austerity of economic atrophy. What he wants to do? To cut energy consumption by, I've read 10%, but I think in his speech he actually said 50% in Milan. Maybe I got this wrong. But a huge cut in energy uh, consumption, a huge cut in production, and a huge cut in raw material use. Uh, if economic atrophy takes over Europe, Africa dies. In other words, economic atrophy in the European economic area would lead inexorably to genocide elsewhere in the world. It's just inevitable, and it would drag down the whole world economy. Um, he says he doesn't like production. He doesn't like energy production. His model, he says, not a jumbo jet, but a blimp a dirigible. Well, maybe he's Colonel Blimp uh, himself. Now, ironically also, the movement says that they want public transportation. They don't want individual cars. But when it comes to building public transportation, the answer is no. Cases in point. This TAV, the uh, high-speed rail, right? We just heard Berlusconi boasting about his high-speed rail achievements. Uh, in the Valley of Susa between Turin and France, right, this highly industrialized Turin area, uh, 
part of the industrial triangle of Italy. You want to build uh, a high-speed uh, rail tunnel that goes through there. This is part of a uh, freight corridor that goes across northern Italy, and it's absolutely crucial for uh, tens of thousands of jobs. There's a movement of anarchists and uh, localists in this Sousa Valley who say, no, we don't want it. This is one of the main components of Grillo, is this. There's a plan, right? We know my my, uh, my old uh, friend there is trying to build the bridge from uh, Calabria to Sicily across the Straits of, uh, of Messina. Grillo says, no. How about a subway for the city of Parma? No. So there's a general progressive consensus in the world. Any, anybody in the U.S., I think, is going to pay lip service. Even even Obama would, would say um, the way to uh, create jobs and get out of the crisis is to have infrastructure built. Now, he, of course, you know, he, what, what, what kind of infrastructure? But Grillo says no to all of that. In other words, the goal is to lower your energy uh, consumption. So uh, this is no good. Instead, it's this the petty bourgeois view, there is no class struggle, there's only conflicts of individuals, and the problem is that some people are bad because they're corrupt. So, la casta, that <clears throat> politicians are a caste <clears throat> apart. And, of course, the depression is here because money was stolen. And if you want to end the depression, you've got to claw back the money. Now, of course, this is not true. The reason you have a depression is that the surplus was aborted, right? it was misdirected, uh, by the uh, ruling elite, the main the investments that were needed were not made, and instead a bubble was created, which has now collapsed, and that's why you have a depression. So that's what you've got uh, to deal with. Um, other than this, he says he he has all these pie in the sky demands. He says free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, and that's what Obama wants. Yeah, fine, free universal Wi-Fi for all. But then he says he wants to have a a, a, a work week of 30 hours, which becomes a work week of 20 hours very soon. Uh, not easy to do. Um, and then a guaranteed income for everybody uh, to prevent suicides. Now, the suicide issue is absolutely uh, crucial. It, it's real. People have been driven to suicide by Monty, the IMF, and the European Central Bank. But the problem with Grillo is how in in the world can you have a 20 or 30 hour work week and a guaranteed annual income for everybody uh, that would be like open-ended unemployment among other things, or even if you never had a job, you'd get this. How can you do that if you're saying that you can't have modern production? It simply can't be done. Uh, that is, I guess, the point where this right-wing populism, because it is right-wing, this is, this is ultimately reactionary, uh, it's just another version of, of, uh, of austerity. This is where it breaks down. How can you have everything all at once? 20-hour week, guaranteed income for everybody. At the same time, we're lowering energy, lowering production, lowering, lowering the use of raw materials. This is economic uh, suicide. He's also, he's a, he sounds like a Republican on many issues. He wants term limits. He's obsessed with debt. He doesn't talk about unemployment as much as he does about debt. Debt is closer to the heart of the matter uh, for him. He doesn't want anchor babies. This is amazing. Here we have the 14th Amendment. Italy, if you are brought you know, by your parents or from Somalia, you're brought to Italy, you're born there, uh, you're a citizen, just like the U.S. Grillo says, no, you can't have people getting citizenship if they're born in Italy. That's no good. And, again, his austerity, he brings you just another kind of austerity. We've seen that he's attacking the parties along the lines of, I think, inspired by the U.S. intelligence community. Not so different from the Tea Party, right? Term limits, obsessed by debt. You get the idea. So, this is a recipe for the thermodynamic collapse of the Italian economy. The economics of decrescita or atrophy have to be rejected, and this is very, very bad news. And we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, our last segment. Just another word about Grillo. This is a recipe for chaos. He wants to have referendums about everything. He wants to bring 80 or 100 political novices into the parliament. Look at what these Tea Party lunatics have done in Washington. 
it, it does take a certain amount of uh, experience. And he's made sure that the people who have experience, anybody who's got an elective office, be it in Sicily or Parma or other places, they were not allowed to run for parliament. So only novices are allowed, not anybody with any kind of local, regional, municipal political experience. The other thing about him, right-wing, anti-euro. He wants a referendum on the euro. So you get the entire uh, picture. And uh, vulgar, foul-mouthed, uh, we won't go into that, but you'll, uh, you'll get the picture uh, if he gets anywhere in these elections. But now, let's turn to our friend Reverend Pinckney in, uh, in Michigan. Now, we hope to do... Reverend, are you there? I'm here. Wonderful. Look, we have to do three things, and we got a little bit less than 10 minutes. We want to hear, what did you accomplish in Los Angeles? What are you planning for uh, Baltimore? And what does it look like there in Michigan in the fight against Snyder and the uh, emergency managers and the, uh, the uh, austerity policies? Well, let me, let me start with uh, Benton Harbor and the dictator himself. Great. Here we, we have a, a, a new emergency manager. Tony Saunders, he took over for Joseph Harris. Joseph Harris was actually ran out of town, and he was ran out of town by Whirlpool Corporation. They went to the governor, the guy who actually wrote the bill, went to the governor and told the governor that they wanted Joseph Harris removed. Now, this is a major setback for them. Because remember, this guy, Al Pachoka, he wrote the bill. But he went to the governor and told the governor that Joseph Harris must leave. He had done such a horrible job. Matter of fact, the city is worse off now than it's ever been. And we are uh, in dire. But here's what happened. Just recently, they introduced a new dictator, the emergency manager. And the people from Whirlpool and, and some of the communities who supported him came in and was dancing, thinking that Tony Sanders, the new emergency manager, was going to straighten the city out. He's only going to do what the governor allowed him to do. He's not coming in with any extra money. Matter of fact, we're so, we're so bad off now that I don't even know what's going to happen next. But we, we continue this fight because we're going to get rid of Tony Sanders also. He's on his way out, and he just got here. Good for you, Reverend. That's the spirit. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and we, we just want people to know that uh, this emergency manager is coming to your home next. Because remember this, they have trained 175 emergency managers here in the state of Michigan already. Wow. So we have to be prepared mentally to deal with this because uh, even in, I believe, it's Stanton, Pennsylvania, they're also talking about, and it's, it's Canning, New Jersey, uh, those places are also uh, are on the hit list, according to some people. Hmm. Well, let, let me get into the uh, NAACP, the Image Award. Please do. The Image Award I, uh, was tremendous. We, we had a tremendous time out there. Uh, well, so some of the stuff that was going on was so incredible. We had the whole building surrounded. I mean, it was like uh, uh, if, if Harry Belafonte got in, he had to see us. And Harry Belafonte, you can look on the Internet and listen to what he said in reference to the NAACP. He basically was telling the NAACP that you have been silenced for too long. And then also that you are responsible for some of the stuff that's happening. Well, he also indicated in his speech as we have been saying for all these, uh, uh, for the last, I mean, maybe a year or so, that the NAACP is out of touch with the community. One of the things that we accomplished that was so amazing, one of the ladies who was going in, her and her fiancé, her husband, whoever he was, her sister and her cousin, all of them was going into the image awards. And after we got through explaining to them, in reference to the NAACP and why we was out protesting, they took their tickets and tore them up and refused to go in. And I thought that was a tremendous. These are tickets that they paid for and was not given to freely. So basically what we're doing now, we're staying focused, we're showing them what we're capable of doing, and we're taking this thing to a whole different level. And number three, which is even far more important, we're going to be in Washington, 
April the 3rd, and we're going to go to the House and to the Senate, and we're going to demand that the NAACP 501c3 nonprofit status be revoked. We want it revoked. We want to make sure that we're also going to picket the NAACP in Washington, D.C. Uh, on that day. Then on the 4th, we're going down to the national headquarters. That is the assassination of uh, uh, um, the 45th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And we plan to be right in front of the NAACP, uh, letting them know that we don't appreciate what, they, what they're doing and what they're doing to our community and to the people. All right, so April 3rd in Washington, D.C., that sounds like a day of lobbying. That sounds interesting. Yes, so absolutely. Matter that we plan to lobby to make sure they understand that we want a complete and a thorough investigation of the NAACP and uh, to find out exactly what's really going on with them because they have uh, 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 allowed our community uh, uh, they have, what they have done to our community is has been incredible, and they really don't support the black community at all. So the, if I understand now, the speech from Harry Belafonte that I think people know, right, he's associated with causes, he basically yes. says, start fighting for something, you guys, right? Right, that's basically what he was telling them. And the camera was directly on Ben Jealous as he was speaking, and he looked like he could have crawled right underneath the chair. <laughs> Is, do we have the speech of Harry Belafonte on the Internet or something like that? It's on the Internet. Also, Cindy Poirier said some very kind words also. Jamie Foxx said something. They said, that was, I don't know what he was talking about. He was, you know, he, he, I think he mentioned he didn't deserve this uh, award. And uh, something about the, the NWAC done something. I don't know what he was saying. He had mentioned the NWACP, but somebody said it, it sounded okay. So I don't know what that means. But there was other people also, Kerry Washington and a few other people actually mentioned the NAACP and a lack of uh, uh, work in the community. So that all came out on the, on the program, and uh, which was pretty interesting because I would never think that you receive an award that you would also blast the person that's giving you the award. <laughs> yes, that's, well, of course, it's an extreme situation. I, I, I'm glad to hear that he spoke up. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, what he did, with, I mean, was so tremendous, but we was out there. We was in their face. I mean, when, when people came in, the celebrities, they had to finish, they had to spin stuff, but we were, he, they was able to see our signs, and, and which was so, so good. Even if they snuck in through another entrance, they would have to see some of us. Like I said, we had the whole building surrounded. Nobody could get in without seeing us. Okay. Well, I think well, we accomplished quite a bit on this day. I, I think it was, it was it was so tremendous. It also let the world know that we're serious about what we're doing. We want to hold the NAACP accountable for their actions and their inaction. And we're demanding that Ben Jealous resign, including the board, and allow the members to elect the president and the board members. All right, so they have new leadership, a, a new pro, a new way to elect them, and I believe an audit also is part of. Oh, that. absolutely, we, we must have that audit. That's when the IRS comes in, and also when we we're going to go to the uh, uh, the, the Republican Party because I know that they're going to be happy to hear that somebody fighting against the NAACP. Well, and, uh, and especially with a little authority behind us. That sounds very interesting. So. April the third. I, I guess we have some people in the area here, and I guess you're gonna you're gonna put out a uh, a press release pretty soon, so we can send it around. And um, you know, a, a few people go a long way in that kind of work. Absolutely, and I appreciate that too, because you know we, we got to continue this fight regardless. Okay, Reverend. The music tells us that we're we're done. We've we've run out of time for this week. The computer is pitiless, so we have to let you go. We'll talk to you in a, in a week or two about uh, about the organizing process, but April 3rd in Washington, April 4th in, uh, in Baltimore. Baltimore. And that sounds, hey, that sounds like a very day. interesting day of lobbying. Everybody have a good day. Remember, April, April the 3rd and 4th. Okay. We'll be in touch, Reverend. Thank you very much. Best of, best of luck and, and uh, you know, get a lot done in the meantime. And we're, the, we're uh, World Crisis Radio here, and we'll be back next week. Uh, with uh, with the results, among other things, of the Italian elections and an update on the conclave. <laughs>